Well, good morning. Certainly a pleasure and a blessing to be here again this, this, uh, this morning to, to, to not only be with each and every one of you, but to worship our God in spirit and in truth. Um, we have been excited as a family to be able to come back here. Um, Chloe and I have been excited, but Oliver's been excited too. Um, he's been asking us about the, the elevator. Um, he's been saying, I want to go see the elevator and so on. Um, he may not remember each and every one of you, but take it as you will, however you want to. Um, but he's been excited. He's been asking us constantly uh, about, about it. But we have been blessed by your hospitality and for each and every one of you accommodating us. And so we're thankful to be back here and to be able to get to see each and every one of you again that we met last time, but also to get to see faces that we weren't able and privileged to meet um, the previous time here. So we're thankful for this time to be here with you uh, this morning. When you deal with transitions in life or maybe um, in stressful situations in your life, how, how do you deal with it? Perhaps maybe how, how do you, how do you uh, struggle through or maybe what comes to mind, what's your immediate reaction whenever a change in your life occurs or a transition? Maybe it may be a very personal, individual thing. Maybe it's a transition of jobs, or maybe it's, it's a relational transition, a relationship change, or something along those lines. Something that was in a constant state previously, but then something changed from that. What do we do? Maybe not only personally, but what about congregationally? What do we do as the body of Christ here in League City, but also worldwide? What do we do as a church? Whenever we think about this idea of transition or change, it may be hard sometimes to keep unity. But brethren, whenever we think about unity, whenever we think about the church, the church is called to be unified. And so this morning, I'd like for us to, the, the, to take this idea of maintaining unity through transitions. Now, I've been instructed, and it was pointed out by Tyler, um, to not go on walk on this side because those on the live stream, you only see my legs um, so I'm not gonna, I'm gonna avoid that area. Um, so this place will be my, my, my battleground here. But, uh, whenever we think about maintaining unity through transition, specifically endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, brethren, whenever we're faced with stressful times, to sum up these past few years, these past three years, it has been a matter of fact stressful, not only on the world, but also for the church. We have been faced with a dramatic change and a dramatic shift and a dramatic transition. And what do we do? Brethren, we are called to maintain unity. We are called to keep it together and to come closer together. And so with this idea of, of maintaining unity through transition, I'd I like for us to look at the book of Ephesians this morning. If you have your Bibles with you, I'd, like, I'd invite you to open up to Ephesians, to the book of Ephesians. And so whenever we see the book of Ephesians, we're going to see an, a book that is filled with transition and changes. In fact, if you wanted to break down the book of Ephesians, it would be simply broken down. Chapters 1 through 3 is all about the gospel or the mystery. Chapters 4 through 6, it's us. If you want to get more, uh, I guess, uh, uh, scholarly about the outline or breaking it down, chapters three through, 1 through 3 would be doctrinal. It would be the doctrinal section. Chapters 4 through 6 will be the practical. Of things that you and I can take and you and I can apply to our lives and to make better for us. But when we really look about the church of Ephesus in the New Testament, it's perhaps maybe the most notable church that we read and the most uh, uh, one that is uh, written about throughout the entirety of the New Testament. We can look at its beginnings in the book of Acts. In fact, we can see Paul's relationship begin and, uh, with the elders there in Acts chapter 20 when he calls for the shepherds to meet with him when he's traveling in Troas. And he warns them that there are going to be false teachers that come to them teaching false doctrines. And he gives them the, the, the encouragement to remain steadfast and to preach the entire counsel of God and to shepherd the flock as they're called to do. But then you think about the book of Ephesians, as we're looking at now. You think about Timothy's interaction uh, of with the, the, the Ephesian uh, brethren there, uh, of how he is, 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 there to, is there to preach there, and how Paul is encouraging him in, in his epistles to Timothy. But then also you think about the book of Revelation, of how one of the, the letters written to the seven churches of Asia Minor is written to Ephesus. In fact, they're the first on the list. And Jesus would say, you have lost your first love. Brethren, this is a church that we have 
written a lot about, that we know a lot about, and unfortunately we don't know a lot about several other churches, but we know about the book of, we know about Ephesians. We know about them and the church of Ephesus. When you think about how they came about becoming Christians, and you think about this idea of transitions of their life, let's look at how they were going through transition. You open up the book of Ephesians, and you're going to see Paul beginning in, in, beginning in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the, heaven, in the heavenly places in Christ. Summing up Ephesians chapter 1, it's going to be focusing on every spiritual blessing that we have of in, in, in Him, in Christ, in Jesus, in the location of the church in whom we are called to be like. It's all found through Him. Then Ephesians chapter 2 is going to open up in verse 1. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you walked, once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the air, or the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. He says, you were once this way, you were once dead. But look at verse 4 of chapter 2. He says, but God, who is rich in mercy... Because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together in, with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Then the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So he's already portraying to the mindset of, you've gone from a change here, you weren't once this way, and now you're, you're a different being now. Brethren, these guys have made a transition. They have. In fact, it's gone from very personal. Paul, even ours already reread it, has already appealed to that, that they have gone from a very personal change and transition. They were once dead in their trespasses. Now they're made alive. They now have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly, heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So you have that personal change. That personal transition. Now think about relationally now. Remember whenever you're looking at the Old Testament and how God chose his people and the Israelites to be his people. But also remember in your mind how there was much animosity and hatred and, very, and a very prideful sense that came from the Jews because they knew that they were God's chosen people. And remember how they treated the Gentiles. Those who weren't, who, who weren't part of that body and those who weren't um, God's chosen people there. But then God brought the Gentiles together with the Jews through Jesus. And in fact, he, he does it the personal aspect and then he goes to the relational now. Go to verse, uh, verse 11 now of chapter 2. Therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at the time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once afar off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. He says now, remember, remember you were once this way, you were once dead in your trespasses, but God who is rich in mercy, he has saved you and he's brought you near to not only him, but also to the commonwealth of Israel. You were once far away from being close to the Jews. You were set apart. You were, you were, you were far away. You were nowhere near them. But Jesus brought you near. In fact, chapter 2 is all about that. In verse 14, he'd say, For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. Verse 16, that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached to peace to you who were far off and those who were near, for through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. It's brought together, Jew and Gentile are together. Because Jesus, in verse 14, has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished the enmity of the law, of the old law. So, so begins a lot of the problems in the New Testament. 
In fact, you have uh, several other letters that are written strictly about this. You have, um, you have even the, the entirety of the book of Romans, really. It's focused on reconciling and bringing together Jews and Greeks and, and, and Gentiles of everyone who is, who, who's not part of the Israelites and not part of that, that nation of who are far, are far off from a different place, who are now are called Christians, who are now brought together by the blood of Christ. And so Paul is trying to reconcile that. In the book of Romans, he's doing it now in Ephesians. And what does he tell these brethren to do? Overall, we get to see in, in Ephesians chapter 4, which will be our, uh, our text this morning, what you see in chapter 3, he's going to focus on the mystery or the purpose of the gospel. And he's overall going to say, look, this was in the mind of God from the very beginning. It's nothing new. In fact, he says that in verse 5 of chapter 3, in which other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. It's nothing new for these guys. Then Ephesians chapter 4 opens up. In fact, I think we, when we look at Ephesians chapter 4, we get to the very heart of the book now. Of the whole purpose Paul is writing. He says, I therefore, in verse 1, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you are called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Paul then encourages them. It's an imperative. I beseech you, I urge you to maintain unity. So this transition that they had from once being afar off from God, from once being dead in their trespasses, they're brought near. But then not only do they have to walk through their personal relationship with God, they have to endeavor to keep the spirit of unity together between Jew and Gentile. Brethren, that's a hard thing to do whenever you think about their history of animosity and change, but a drastic change occurred. And so for us this morning, how do we maintain unity through transitions? Whether that be personally or whether that be congregationally. This morning, I'd like for us to look at three points from Ephesians chapter 4 that will help us understand how we can maintain unity and endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace as Paul has commanded these Christians to do. Number one, if we are to maintain unity through transitions... It starts with considering the unity I have with God. It starts with considering the unity I have with God. Look at verses 1 through 3 again. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the, spirit, the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Verse 4, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. Before I e can even tackle or even discuss maintaining unity with my brothers and sisters in Christ or in encouraging them and, and building them up and having a closer uh, relationship with them and, and, and cultivating fellowship amongst one another, I have to first think about the relationship I have with God the Father. It starts there first. He says here, uh, let beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you are called. The only way we can be sure we're walking worthy of the calling, and the calling which he's referencing is all found in verse 3. It's this go the gospel of Jesus Christ. Everything that God had instituted, he had a mind in the beginning of time. It's that calling. I must consider if I am, and I must think and really be introspective and examine myself if I am walking worthy. It's nothing new. This principle is nothing new. You think about when Jesus would say uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, do not go up to your brother and look at the speck in your brother's eye when you have a beam in your own eye. Overall, it's don't be hypocritical, but tend to your affairs first and then go to your brother. Paul is saying here, look at yourself first. Consider the unity you have with God because 
If you don't, if you have a poor relationship with God the Father, brethren, your relationships on this earth aren't going to be the same or on par with that. It's going to be an an example. It's going to be uh, filtered through everything else. Our relationship with God the Father helps us deal with one another, if you will, or help one another. You think about uh, Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. Uh, Paul would say this same principle only lets your conduct be worthy of the gospel. Consider yourself. Think about how you're acting. Think about how you're behaving. Paul would encourage Timothy in 1, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15 and 16. I write these things to you that you may ought to know how you conduct yourself in the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth. Paul is appealing to consider ourselves. You think about the fruit of the Spirit. How Paul would say in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and following, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, peace, joy. And then he finishes off by saying it's long-suffering, gentleness, kindness, it's goodness. Brethren, the first three attributes of the fruit of the Spirit there in that passage, I mean, all those attributes come from God. But you think about those first three. If you have those first three, and you tend to those first three, and cultivate those first three, and practice those first three, you then can practice all the other ones. Because it all stems from my personal relationship with God the Father, focusing on Him, focusing on His Word, and thinking about what He wants me to do. And improving my relationship with Him, I learn to be loving, I learn to be joyful, and I learn to have peace that only He provides. And then, and only then, I can truly practice long-suffering. I can truly practice being good. Brethren, there's a relational aspect there on the last attributes that we cannot miss. It all starts with considering the relationship we have with God the Father. If I am to maintain unity through transition, whether that be a very personal change in my life, or whether that be congregationally, I must consider the unity I have with God the Father first. And so we see that in verse 3, of endeavoring to keep the spirit of the bond of peace. We can truly practice that. But first, we must do it personally, individually, with our personal relationship with God. Secondly, this morning, if we are to maintain unity through transitions, it is by striving to be involved in the work of ministry. Striving to be involved in the work of ministry. Look at verses 11 through 14. We'll touch on verse 7. But we're not going to just miss verse 7 in the previous verses there. But look at verses 11 through 14 briefly. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of, stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. When you look at this section here, it really begins in verse 7. But the main section of our point here, at least for striving to be involved in the work of ministry, will come from verses 11 and following. But you look at verse 7 briefly, he says, But to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Now when we think about this grace, whenever you look at Scripture, you have to determine which, which grace he's referring to here. In fact, it's found in different places now. Is this the same grace that he's referencing in, in, verse, in chapter 2 and verse 4, which we have been saved by grace through Jesus? In fact, he says it in verse 3, in chapter 3 again. He says in verse 7, Of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. It seems that something else is at play here. Whenever you think about this grace or this gift that Paul was given, Paul was given the ability to, to, he was inspired, but he was given the ability to lay on hands and pass on the, the, uh, the ability for, for people to, to practice miraculous gifts. It seems that this grace is being referenced here. It, it's found also in Romans chapter, chapter 12 uh, with the same idea of this grace given to us 
Spiritual gifts are mentioned. Same thing in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 through 14, which deals with all about miraculous gifts and how the Christians of the first century were, were, were instructed to deal with it and how they should be utilizing it for the edifying of the body. So the grace that's mentioned here in verse 7, brethren, it's different for us. It's not the same one. We don't have the ability to practice miraculous gifts. We can't speak in tongues miraculously. We can't heal. We can't do all these things. Because we have the perfected revelation of God in our hands today. Miraculous gifts served a purpose, and so that has passed away. 1 Corinthians 13. But we still see here in verse 11 of chapter 4 is ministry. At that time in the first century, God gave people different roles. For what purpose? Verse 12. For the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. Now he gave some to be apostles, some prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Pastors, elders. Some of these roles we still see today. Some of them we don't see. But brethren, whenever you think about us today, there's a role, specific role that you and I have a part to play in the body of Christ. I fully believe that we have been given, each and every one of us, a unique talent, a unique skill set that will benefit the body of Christ. Now, you may not be familiar with what that is personally for yourself. You may be still endeavoring and finding what, what, what you're passionate about and figuring out what you like to do and, and how you can help of service. Brethren, there's something you can play. There's something you can do for the body of Christ. This passage really teaches, and I really think it has really uh, been a detriment to our churches worldwide. But the mentality, and I've heard some people say, well, that's just the preacher's job. Or, well, that's just the elder's job to do. Brethren, that mentality harms the church. And in fact, it doesn't accomplish endeavoring to keep the spirit, uh, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. God never intended for that mentality to occur. Now, that's not to say that the positions that we have for, for preachers and for elders should be minimized. In fact, God highly exalts those roles. But brethren, sometimes we think we can't do enough because we think that it's only our elders' job to do and that it's only our preacher's job to do, which is that's not true. In fact, verse 13 says this. He says, till we all come. That means you, and that means me. That means all of us here in the body of Christ. If we are truly to be unified, it takes each and every one of us in the church to work. And this is where verse 16 comes in. From whom the whole body joined and knit together by what, of, by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which, by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Notice what it did say. It didn't say. It didn't say in which only one person does its share and then everyone's good or one group of people does its share. It says every part does its share. Every joint supplies for the growth of the body, for the edifying of itself in love. A, a body cannot function fully if it didn't have all its members. Or, or you think about how, how uh, maybe the, the left arm is doing something different than the right arm. But I love how God instituted and designed the human body. It's everything coming together to push forward. Brethren, that's the, that's the body that we have described in the New Testament. That's the church. And so if we're to maintain unity through transitions, it is by striving to be involved in the work of ministry. And I encourage the elders here to look at its members and to find ways that each one can plug in so that we each and each and every one of us can be involved in ministry of equipping and building each other up. If we're to maintain unity through transition, we must consider our relationship and unity we have with God. We must secondly strive to be involved in the work of ministry. And lastly, number three, 
we must continue to move forward. It's by continuing to move forward. Look at verses 17 and following now. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who, being past feeling, have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanness with greediness. Verse 20, But you have not so learned Christ if you indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to deceitful lust and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Paul is over here overall appealing to their previous state again. He says, you were once Gentiles, you once were alienated from God, you had, the, you, were, you, you had the fertility of your mind, your understanding was darkened. You have not so learned Christ if you indeed heard him and have been taught by him. But he says, but you put off your, that you put off your former conduct. Overall, don't go back to the way you were living because you were different now. It was easy for them, maybe, during their time period being surrounded by the Gentiles and being surrounded by their previous life to ease back into it and to drift back. In fact, that's what the book of Hebrews is all about. And brethren, whenever we think about this idea of, uh, of continuing to move forward, Paul says you've made progress. Don't look back. Continue to move forward. In a sense, he's saying don't dwell on the past. Don't dwell on how things used to be and the the pleasurable things that used to be, the temporary pleasurable things that you used to do because it's going to affect your present and your future. Brethren, the same thing can be said for us personally whenever we think about our previous life. The things that we think about that we previously did without Jesus in our life, it can cause us and tempt us to go back and practice that. Put it off. Continue to throw it away. Crumple it up and throw it away from you is the language here. But even our church, even the church, it's easy for us to look back pre-COVID and then look now. And this is churches worldwide. Everywhere. And think, man, it was so much better back then. And we can continue to dwell on that and we can forget what's happening right in front of us. It's the same thing as you recall our study in the book of Haggai a few weeks ago in our our Bible class of of, uh, they're rebuilding the temple. The foundation was laid and, and, and Haggai is preaching to them to encourage and build the temple up and they see this temple. They see the work that's being done and they're discouraged. Ezra would write that they, they saw the foundation and they wept for it. But God says there's something better coming. Don't lose focus. This temple is going to be greater and better and the desire of all nations is going to come. It's describing the church. And brethren, for us, we can lose sight too of what's currently going on now. We can lose sight of the future if we continue to dwell on the past. So if we want to strive and endeavor for unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, and maintain this unity that we have in Jesus, the unity that Jesus prayed for, is by continuing to look forward. And by utilizing the ministry and striving for ministry and to equip one another to look towards heaven, which is something far greater than what we have on this world, and something we ought to look forward to. Brethren, God requires us to be unified and to maintain that unity. In fact, I love that he doesn't say that you are unified already. He says to endeavor, endeavoring. It's a constant, active goal that we must continue. And it all starts with everyone in this room. It all takes everyone in this room having that mentality and striving for it. Brethren, God has caused, called us to maintain unity. In fact, the purpose behind it is, if 
you look at Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 9 and 10, see something far beyond comprehension and overall awesome. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. And to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ. Verse 10, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. You know what all that says? The wisdom of God. Everything that he's done in history, everything that he's done for mankind is made known to all through the church. And brethren, if we are not unified, if we are divisive, if we're not even getting along together, you know what we're showing people outside of those doors and outside the church? That God had no idea what he was doing. We show people the wisdom of God, and we glorify him. That is our purpose of the church. And by maintaining unity through transition and the changes that we have in this life, we can make known the manifold wisdom of God by doing so. And so this morning, are we truly maintaining unity? Not only congregationally, but individually. Have you considered the unity that you have with God? Have you considered striving for the work of ministry? And have you been dwelling too much on the past of your former life? And that extends also congregationally as well. Perhaps you're here this morning, and maybe you haven't considered the fellowship that you don't have with God yet. And maybe you are here this morning that you're wanting to to be unified with God. And you can do so by studying, by hearing the Word of God, by by, uh, believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, by confessing that He is Lord of all, and then by being baptized for the remission of your sins and living faithfully unto death, you then must live worthy of the calling with which you've been called. But it starts with you. We have men here that that are equipped to help you and to study with you and to assist you. Maybe this morning you're here and maybe something has caused you in your life a transition or change that has allowed doubt to creep in. That has allowed your unity to God to to be skewed and to to be a, a, a detriment to you understand that there are consequences for that and that they that can harm you eternally maybe you're here this morning and maybe you've gone complacent in your life with the church with god entirely the beauty about the church is he has instituted people to help you and to know that you're not alone but it all takes the first step of making known your needs to your brothers and sisters in christ who can help you If there's any way we can assist you this morning, we ask that you come forward as we stand and sing the song that's been selected.